Welcome to The Fix. Sit down with copywriting experts Nick O'Connor and Glenn Fisher as they review, discuss and improve real world copy sent in by you. This is The Fix. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Fix. Something a little bit different uh, for you today. We're not going to be looking at a piece of copy. We're going to be doing something that's arguably more important. So first thing you will have noticed, I am not joined by Glenn Fisher today. He is stuck on a train outside London. Uh, instead, I'm joined by Jamie Ryder. Now, I'll give you a little bit of backstory before I let Jamie introduce himself. Jamie is a member of the Fix Accelerator, our uh, sort of close-knit group of writers, marketers, copywriters, various people from the industry. And as part of the work that we do at the Fix Accelerator, we do social events. Uh, last year, we did one in Manchester, and Jamie came along to that. And we were sat in the pub, uh, probably a couple of, deep, uh, couple of drinks deep. And Jamie said to me, um, why have you never done anything about uh, the mental health side of writing because it's really important and I sort of thought about it for a second and I thought I don't really know uh, why we haven't certainly not through any conscious choice but probably if I'm honest with myself because I wouldn't feel qualified to talk about such a important topic uh, with any authority or credibility and Jamie said well why don't you let me come on the show and, and I'll talk about it because I have a bit more experience when it comes to these sorts of things. Now that was in um, uh, late October last year. So it's taken us four or five months to finally get around to recording this episode, but it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Jamie to the show. Jamie, uh, first of all, welcome and thank you. But second of all, could you um, tell everyone a little bit about your background and then we'll get into a few things that I wanted to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Nick. I'm really happy to come on the show and talk about a few things surrounding mental health and creativity. These topics are a huge amount of uh, importance generally. And from my background, as you said, I'm from Manchester. From a copywriting side, I think I've been doing it now for maybe about seven or eight years, mostly from an agency background. But generally, creative writing, the act of writing has been something that I've always loved as far as I can remember. And it's always been something as a medium that has been helpful for creative freedom, but also from the marketing side and bringing it in to try to understand myself and other people as well. Yeah, so when it comes to it's kind of mental health side of things. What I, what I wanted to talk about to begin with, or what I wanted to ask you is mental health is a sort of, you know, you would capitalize both words, wouldn't you? You know, you would say, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a proper noun. It's a real thing. It has a real center of gravity and a real gravitas that comes with that. And I think that makes somebody like me that feels like I don't uh, have enough experience of dealing with those sorts of things, wary to stay away from it. So I would describe myself as somebody that isn't experienced when it comes to mental health. And, and I would also describe myself as somebody that hasn't suffered with mental health issues. However, as a writer, I know very well the anxiety uh, of, 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 you know, what is a solo task? It's you against the world. The isolation of, of standing in a little room like this and trying to figure things out and write it down. The fear of putting your work out there and waiting for feedback from the market or from a you know, fellow writer or publisher, or whatever it might be. Where does that side of things stop and mental health uh, begin? Or is that a completely false dichotomy? Well, it's a really interesting dichotomy and it's probably best that I go back to the start with this because the clarity on and off for many years, I've dealt with social anxiety issues from various outlets and because writing was always there in the background for me. I found that was one of the purest ways that I could get my thoughts out, really work through a lot of things. And if we just take that mental health side, for example, the therapeutic benefits of that creative work are profound because a lot of it is quite simple if you boil it down to just doing journaling, for example. You say you write down at least three positive things that you've done throughout the day. Certainly over the pandemic, that was very useful for me. 
But if you take it more onto the copywriting side of things, I also think that there's a lot of hidden benefits there for people who might have these certain issues as well, because I think reflecting on this through doing specific work, I think it's helped. It really helps to be a better listener as well, because if I take my personal experience, I'm far more of a listener than a talker. When I'm in a big group of people, sometimes I find it quite hard to communicate, but I'll always try to take that extra step to be more of an active listener. And I think just looking at that from a professional standpoint, that really helps. And from the other side as well, if you're trying to talk to somebody who might be trying to understand things like this, it's always good to listen to their perception of it and then try to explain how you feel about it from their side as well. So I think the dichotomy there, there are a couple of ways to look at it, but writing as an act is therapeutic, but also it has benefits if you're trying to do that for a profession too. So social anxiety, th that was something we talked about a little bit, wasn't it, when, when, when we were having a beer? And it's a really interesting subject because writers, as a species, <laughs> tend to be quite, um, well, we're a weird bunch, in my experience. Everybody is different in their own way, but we tend to have characteristics, you know, weird little interests. And I think it's because we're curious people. We kind of follow paths that other people would have kind of uh, left at the wayside and we you know we get down into the weeds of things because I don't know why that is but it tends to be tends to make for a bunch of writers being quite an interesting group of people but is that something the social anxiety side of things obviously we were at a social event so there was a kind of meta layer to what we were talking about none of us really knew each other Glenn and I obviously know each other but we're meeting all of you for the first time it was the first time yes it was the first time so that's an unusual environment to step into. You know, tell me a little bit about the sort of challenges that you've faced when it comes to that side of things and then kind of how you've worked through them because it wasn't something that had held you back. You were there and I had no sense of you as a socially anxious person on that evening. So tell me the story there. Yeah, so if I, if I reflect on maybe five or six years ago in an event like that, working in a big crowd trying to talk and share stories generally that was quite difficult because I think it's very subjective depending on what people go through with that condition but for me certainly when I felt like the physical reactions in a big space or I used to it felt like quite a big weight on my chest like oh everybody's staring at me whereas subjectively it's not it's just what you think in your mind and one of my favorite quotes that I really go back to these days is called we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. And I would say that I probably suffer less in imagination than I do than I used to do because I have found certain coping mechanisms that work for me. And through the conversations of the pub with Glenn, for example, we did talk a bit about philosophy. And generally, that coping mechanism has really worked for me because over the pandemic, that was quite transformative for me because obviously being trapped inside all we had to do was think about things and try to find some way to adapt. And that was during the period where I discovered philosophy. And then that rabbit hole really made a lot of sense to me over reflecting back on things. And then by being able to become more aware of those physical reactions, for example, that tight chest or that dryness of breath or the thoughts, it's using certain, like, I guess, mental health tricks that can reframe things and then you can calibrate yourself to that conversation or if you could just feel comfortable to say look can we just talk about this in a smaller group kind of thing so just reflecting on that progress that is really vindicating for me because doing that sort of thing a few years ago that would have probably not been something I would have been able to do okay so there's loads to unpack there so I'm going to get all my questions out and then let you take them um one at a time or at your own pace I guess um I guess the well, I would certainly agree that community is such an important part of being a writer, especially being a freelancer. You know, I don't I I'm sure there is a uh, there's a mental health dimension to that, but it goes beyond that. You know, we need to feel like we're part of a tribe, so to speak. That might be if you're working in house, you're part of a writer's room, but lots of us aren't. So being able to go into those situations and and connect with other writers is really important. So whatever you can do to put yourself at ease in those things is, is, is crucial. But I guess I'm interested in 
your your journey when it comes to philosophy. Now, Glenn talks a lot about philosophy uh, on the show, but as we probably have all worked out, it's more a chance for him to show off than 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 anything else. But so it's not something that we ever really pursue because I think, oh God, don't let him start. I just he'll get a book out. And but I'm interested in you know your, your journey when it came to philosophy, like actually which philosophers and which philosophies did you find uh useful i suppose that's the wrong word that makes it sound way more prosaic than it is but you know what i mean uh, and then and then I'd, I'd love to know when well, you talked about sort of techniques or exercises i guess you do to try and put you know get yourself through those situations where you might have struggled in the past so curious to know about those so that's a lot <laughs> so, but oh, just, just tackle those questions in your own time yeah yeah well there you go that's always the opening of a great philosophical debate um Basically, the philosophy that has really helped me progress in different ways is Stoicism. And I'll admit, when I first thought of the word Stoic, what came to mind for me was, you know, the classic British thing, uh, we must grit our teeth and just get through it and just feeling quite, you know, emotionless or robotic. And then through the pandemic, I discovered the biggest version of Stoicism, which is essentially the opposite of saying you need to be active you need to be out there in the world and to learn how to regulate these emotions of anxiety or depression or some things that can be, be quite negative sometimes in an appropriate way and that really galvanized me to actually shift and to actually want to be a freelance copywriter at the same time because within that context having come from mostly an agency background adding on to the pandemic I felt quite a bit of burnout so I had to really reflect a lot of things and think do I want to continue down this path or do I need something slightly different and that philosophical thing became quite a nice uh, cure or a coping mechanism now the exercises that really helped me one of them is called the pre-meditation of adversity and essentially that is just trying to rehearse for the worst case possible scenario not in a negative way but I just think say if I was going to walk into a pub in the social for example it's like Right. I don't really know anybody, but what would I do if I had this feeling of anxiety? So it's rehearsing like, what could I do? Could I move around the room? Could I talk to one person, two people? So just trying to plan for those scenarios and then trying to sit with that anxiety for a little minute and build that little bit of resiliency. I think that really helped me. And another one that really helps is called The View From Above, which essentially is taking a big picture view of a situation where you'll imagine that if you're going through some kind of anxiety then if there's somebody else in the room with you or even if it's just in your wider city or location there's probably people that have probably had a bad day as well so you put yourself on their level then you'll take it a step further by imagining you're looking down at the world in like a, a weird astral projection kind of way and then slowly coming back down into yourself and then hopefully by the end of it that will have been diffused because in the grand scheme of things, what you thought about probably wasn't as big of a deal. And the shift in that has been profound for me, just of, of a couple of exercises that really help. Yeah, they're both interesting ways of sort of forcing yourself out of your own head, I, I guess. Um, th this may be completely wrong, but my understanding of stoicism in the, in the, um, in, my, in a very limited way, but one of the things that I remember, or possibly misremember, but it went in as stoic, is that there's a big emphasis on controlling the things you can control, but if you, but but sort of giving in to the things that you can't control, um, which I which I think is where I think that's the seed of where let's let's call it sort of English or British small s stoicism comes from, which is the sort of keep calm and carry on approach, which. I agree, has become twee and anodyne and almost meaningless. But if you wind it back to where it must have began, it was if there are bombs raining down on you, you probably cannot stop that. You can't stop them dropping the bombs. You can't stop the war yourself. I, I think that's where it all comes from. Um, th therefore, stop worrying about that thing and try and find the thing that you can worry about. I think that's become bastardised over the years. And it's, you put it on enough you know, mugs and tea towels and it, it will become something silly but is that reading of stoicism of controlling the things you can control and giving in and and giving in is the wrong word isn't it um accepting the things you cannot control that is stoicism right 
Yeah, so at its core, that is the essence of it. And you are right, say that war situation where there's bombs raining down. Yes, that is a terrible situation. But even within that small microcosm, you could still try to do some good in your own small way. And it's that idea of refocusing or reshifting around certain perspectives, which I really found helpful. And what I generally do love about philosophy anyway is that it's always evolving because the same thing that was there 2000 years ago is massively different than it is today. So there's always new interpretations you can find from it. But to me, I just love the idea that these guys, these philosophers were like psychologists way before psychology was a thing in this mm. sort of knowledge or this wisdom that can be applied is timeless and it is very simple to understand. They were almost like sort of brain hackers to use another completely inapt metaphor, but thinking of ways you can get around your own mental thought processes, I guess, because one of the things that I try to do if I'm struggling, so I think it manifests itself in me in anger. I get angry at things, you know, clients, other people, <laughs> never myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, it. Ma I, I get, I, and I don't have anyone to talk to. You know, I don't have any colleagues, really. I just have my wife inside, and she's got two young kids to look after and isn't always available to be <laughs> complained at. But what she always does say to me is, if you're not, what are you going to do about this problem? And that I always put that back to the stoic uh, mindset which is well if the answer to that is i i'm not going to do anything and because i can't so for instance if you're complaining about a client she might say oh, what are you going to do are you going to stop working for them um no okay well you need to try and let that go then you need and you need to try and think to yourself what can i do sometimes the answer is nothing <laughs> that you know i actually physically cannot change the way this other person is behaving or the way they want to work but actually just stepping back and acknowledging that that I, I'm not prepared to walk away and I'm not prepared to tell them to stop, for instance, because it might be unreasonable for me to do so. Therefore, the only option left is to accept it, to try and be less angry about it because I'm not willing to do anything. And I, I've often found that useful because it breaks things up into the things that mm -hmm. I'm going to do stuff about and the things that I'm not. And I have to just let those go, you know, if I'm not prepared. I always found that to be a useful thing because it starts to feel like it's active. Like I have agency, I can choose what to do. And I think that's a big part of uh, this whole situation, which is when you feel like you're not in control anymore, it's a horrible feeling, right? For sure, yeah. And I just want to touch on that point because to me, when it's like letting go of things, it's like you've given yourself permission to get that time back now because everything that, certainly for me as well, if I spent so much energy obsessing or getting angry or, or about all this kind of stuff, it's like reflecting on it then I'm just wasting my time if I just let go of it then I can just devote it to something that I actually enjoy or if it's work that is in front of me then that uh, shift really helps I think as well and really when I was thinking about this stuff as well I think the idea of neurodiversity in marketing is super fascinating as well because just looking at other people in the community who have gone through similar issues is like profound to see what their journeys are like um there's a really great lady called Ellie Middleton, I think her name is, who suffers from ADHD and autism. And she's like so open about that. But certainly going back to the idea of community as well, I think that is really important to see that there are people out there who are trying to share their story in an authentic way and trying to uplift the community beyond marketing. If you enjoy The Fix and want to get access to even more good stuff, Join the Fix Accelerator today. Get access to special masterclasses from Nick and me. Watch expert interviews with industry legends. Join live copy feedback sessions every week and get connected to our very own private copy network. Visit thefixaccelerator.com for more information. Yeah, that's a that's certainly a key point. And one this is I'm going to couch a kind of way of looking at this, but in copywriting terms, which may be a disaster, but Bear with me. One of the things that I've often found useful is, so we're told when we're marketing that, you know, that you, the customer, the prospect, the other person is the most important thing, that people are constantly thinking about themselves and their own problems and their own issues, and that therefore you need to speak to that, which of course you do. But it's a useful tool for thinking about social situations and interactions with other people, because 
if you keep in mind that everybody's mostly just thinking about themselves, as are you, then that situation where you're worried about what they might be thinking of you or they've pissed you off or whatever they've done that's caused a negative reaction in you, you sort of, it's easier to forgive and explain if you just think they probably weren't thinking about me. They probably weren't looking at me. They probably weren't having, uh, they probably weren't judging me. They probably weren't trying to make me feel like that. They were just dealing with their own situation. And by seeing them like that, I know it sort of is very cynical on one level, but I can think it actually humanizes people. They're not out to get you. They're not trying to make your life hard. They're just dealing with their own shit most of the time. And if you think about them like that, it's a lot easier to then think, well, be less anxious in a social situation because everybody isn't looking at you. Everybody's looking at looking out and thinking about themselves, <laughs> you know? So those sorts of ways of thinking about other people can, well, I've found that to be to be really useful over the years, definitely. Oh, yeah, for sure. But I, I love how everybody's got their own version of that because you learn something new from that and also you are 100% right. We're all flawed. We're all going through our own situation and it all puts us all down on the same level because we're all human and that's the beautiful part of it in some ways yeah and just not well, i can't remember the quote you you shared but about getting out of your own uh head i can't remember it now you'll remind me in a second but just that acknowledgement that a lot of these problems that or uh challenges i guess is a better word are they're they're inside your head they're not necessarily outside so like I don't know, I'll give a really prosaic example, like, you know, you wear an item of clothing that you're uncomfortable with, yeah, or you don't know if it quite suits you or, or, or whatever, and you think to yourself, oh, God, everybody's going to be looking at me, you know, everybody's going to think I look stupid, you have to have that other part of your brain that says they're not even going to be looking, <laughs> they're going to be worried that they look stupid, or that they're overweight, or that their hair doesn't look great that day, or whatever their thing is that day. They're not going around looking for other people to make a judgment of. Very, very few people are like that. That's actually a really liberating view of other people because it allows you to just think, if I'm okay with it, then nobody else is probably even going to notice what shoes I'm wearing or whatever it might be, you know? So I'm making this really consumerist. <laughs> <laughs> no worries no but 100 percent, it's like you, you just take the disarm you just disarm it really because again another quote that comes to mind is the obstacle is the way what you perceive to be that uh weakness or whatever it is you can just turn it into a strength and then just flip it on its head and then you can actually see the the absurdity out of it as well and there's a there's a what's the word there's a humor in there that you can take advantage of i think yeah well that's that whole thing of like once you can laugh at something if you can laugh at anything you're sort of bulletproof because it's mm -hmm. it's it's it, it contextualizes something i just want to go back to the philosophy side of things because obviously that's something that's made, played a big part in your personal life but i know that it's something that's a big part of your your professional life too in terms of helping sort of brands find their own philosophy or applying philosophy to to marketing so Tell me a little bit more about that, because that's really that's a really unique way of approaching our industry. So how did it start and how do you do it? You know, what sort of things do you get up to? Yeah. So going back to the pandemic again, while I discovered stoicism, that really helped me send down the philosophical rabbit hole. But to me, coming from the idea that every business has some values or principles or that philosophy, whatever you want to call it. I think that's always going to be an ongoing journey anyway, and those values are always going to shift. And I think the copy or the content is absolutely key to communicating that too. So that was where the idea came from. And then because stoicism was the thing that galvanized me, it just fell into that. But on one level, it is trying to work with the people to say that if you've got some kind of personal belief and you want to stand by this, then surely you're going to want to try to reflect that in your business. So the beginning of that is around the branding workshop where it is trying to go back to those core values at a foundational level across the customers, their employees and the industry as well in a competitor sense. And then if it's necessary to create like a website or some sales copy out of it, then that it always helps. But at the beginning point, there's a, uh, there's a manifesto that is there just so people can refer back to and evolve as they need to. And because my my interest in mental health is there, that is one of the sectors that I, let, I like to focus on the most. 
So when you're helping a company sketch out its or discover or describe or whatever word you want to use it, it's its philosophy and its values. You know, there's that's an interesting topic, right? Because 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 you could say, I would say, for instance, that lots of companies that claim to have values don't. They just say they do because their behavior is completely contrary mm. to their stated value. How often does that sort of dynamic play out? Because because I would say the way you behave is the manifestation of your values, not the things you say about your values. Um, so talk to me about how you square that off. Or is, am I completely wrong? Is that not necessarily a problem? No, it's a really interesting point because, again, there's, to me, that's the idea of having substance versus actually you know, backing up what you say too. But to me, when I think values, the beginning point of that is it's, you know, buzzwords. You say you want to be authentic or sustainable and just alone. Yeah, they're just buzzwords. But by doing the work and saying, how am I applying that personally or in business as well? If you're just a solopreneur, for example, that is where it starts. But then it is up to them to apply it as well. But as you said, with motivations, an idea that came to me was this idea called fulfillment stories, where I think it's looking at places or points in your life where you can genuinely say you felt fulfilled, whether it's in childhood or something you've done for your friend or in business. And I think that really helps to underpin those values or that core system. Now, with my role as a copywriter, I can write stuff, but I'm not in a position to say that I can hold people accountable to that because I'm not in their business. But I think genuinely, if you do want to stand by that, then yes, you need some sort of accountability in place as well. Yeah, you need to be honest with yourself. I, I would imagine that the smaller the business, the less the, that is a problem because um, the uh, the bigger businesses, it's much harder to hold to account. You know, they can say we're this, we're that on an advertising campaign on the television, you know, like we're for equality, but nobody goes and checks the pay gap or whatever it might be. You know, you know what I mean? It's a lot harder. Whereas if you're a one, two, three person business, then the relationship between what you're doing and what you're saying about what you're doing is much more direct. You know, the, the hypocrisy would be more apparent, mm -hmm. I guess. So I, I suppose it's a little bit easier there, but how have you, how has that whole way of working gone for you? Is it something that has been well received in the market? Have you had to really, have you had to pitch it hard or are people open to that sort of, um, uh, or receptive, I guess, to that kind of approach? So it's gone through a lot of iterations and it's been a really fun uh, journey for me so far because it did start with that idea of looking at the core foundational values, but to obviously get that across, there's been a lot of feedback. Something that I found really useful was beta testing it, demoing, just to get that feedback constantly. And that has really helped to evolve it now to a point where I have started to work with a mental health organization and actually get that across to people. So I do believe beta testing anything is always important in that initial workshop phase yeah just do, do it doing it doing it and accepting that it won't be perfect but it'll be it'll be better the next time you do it and the next time mm -hmm. iterating i guess um so i guess that's kind of everything i wanted to talk to you about i, I just have one final question which is you know if if somebody is watching this, they're a, a writer or an aspiring writer or a marketer, anybody in the in our industry, and they are struggling with or grappling with some of the issues that we've talked about today, whether it's isolation, anxiety, you know, challenges with uh, socializing with other people, what would you encourage them to go away and do to, to take control of that situation or to just take the first step towards overcoming some of those issues? Well, I'm aware this might sound quite trite, but I think that is needed sometimes. I think it is just starting to write something down or anything just to understand what is going on inside your own head. And of course, everybody's situation is massively subjective. But if you genuinely have somebody in your life that you can talk to privately in a setting that does make sense to you, then I would highly recommend just leaning into it. And that is just the start of things and then finding that routine or a mechanism that really helps you make sense of what's going on in your head and just to Im improve in ways that make sense to you. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And just one thing I would add um, is this is the exact opposite point of what I just said earlier about people being very self-obsessed, which is when asked 
to not be self-obsessed and to help other people. Generally speaking, people are fantastic at giving you their time or whatever it might be to talk to. I found that to be the case in the writing community, mostly because a lot of the challenges that we face are pretty common and universal. We've all felt that way at certain points in our career. So try to find somebody to talk to who's going through a similar sort of thing. There are ways of connecting with other people. And I think if you ask, if you ask somebody if they'll listen to you, often they will. Do you know what I mean? It's not, they might not necessarily offer that to you because that's not something you go around offering. But when asked, people are often, you know, there to talk to. Um, so hopefully as, as part of what the work that we do, people make connections, not necessarily with Glenn and myself, but with other writers and those relationships can can uh, bear fruit uh, when it comes to this sort of thing. Sorry, that's almost a plug for what we do, but it's not designed to be. It's that we're part of a community of writers and we have common uh, things. Uh, we have things in common with each other that are, are, are worth talking about, worth connecting over. That's just me though. Um, Jamie, anything you'd you'd like to to say before we wrap things up? I know that Glenn might want to do a sort of part two with you at a later date because he, A, is uh, well into his philosophy, but B, has history working in this this area and, and, and connecting with other writers over some of these issues. So we may well do a part two, but anything you want to say before we wrap up this uh, this episode? Well, just to add to your point, finally, that just asking for help sometimes might feel like the hardest thing in the world. But even if you just get that one person who is just there to listen, then that makes so much of a difference to that one individual. And secondly, this community is great genuinely for copywriting and having people to listen to you. So thank you to you and Glenn for creating this. It's just a very valuable thing for people in this community. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to say, uh, Jamie. I didn't ask him to say that, everybody. Um, but, um, you know, if you're part of the FIX and you want to become a FIX Accelerator member or come along to one of our events, there's plenty of information out there uh, online about that. I'm not going to uh, sort of go into any of that uh, in this uh, show, but I'm sure you'll be able to find out. Um, but uh, aside from that, Jamie, I guess I will see you the next time we're in Manchester for a social uh, or on one of our live calls, if you come on those. But um, thank you very much uh, for joining us and share, you know talking about some of these issues. It's not something that we've spent enough time talking about, but um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. So thank you very much. Oh, again, thank you, Nick. Absolute pleasure as well. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. That's all for this episode. But if you'd like to get your copy reviewed or you've seen some copy you want Nick and Glenn's opinion on, Get in touch at feedback at thefixcopywriting.com. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and share.